Thank you. Why preach on this chapter? Can't we just skip it and get to chapter 37 and Joseph and the beginning of Joseph's story? Well, Moses doesn't want us to do that. And God inspired Moses to include this chapter. And so we're not going to skip it. Um, this isn't part of uh, uh, what Timothy was left in Ephesus to do. Uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy, to command certain men not to devote themselves to endless genealogies. Well, this is not an endless genealogy. It does end. But why is this chapter here? Perhaps that's the better question. Not why preach from this chapter, but why is this chapter here? And it's not the only place this list of name occurs. It occurs again in 1 Chronicles chapter 1. So it occurs twice in the Bible. It's important enough to appear twice. Of course, it's similar to Genesis chapter 25, where the uh, other descendants of Abraham were listed from Keturah uh, and uh, from uh, uh, his um, concubine. Uh, yeah, th those other descendants of Abraham that aren't part of the chosen family. In Genesis 25, you have the list of those other descendants of Abraham, a branch uh, from the tree. And back in Genesis chapter 10, you remember, we had the descendants of Noah, we're interested in the family of Shem. That's uh, where this Jacob's family comes from. But the other families were also spoken of, Ham and Japheth, those other branches from the tree. So uh, we've got the main uh, branch that's coming down, or the, the, the stem of the tree uh, from which Jesus will come uh, eventually. And these are branches that go off. This is one of the branches that goes off from that main stem. But I think there are three other reasons. It's, it's one of the branches that comes off the stem. But I think there are three other reasons why Moses was inspired to include this information that will have something to say to us today. It's not like um, uh, the, uh, when you're looking through your family tree, ancestors, none of our ancestors are going to appear here. But there's something relevant for us in this chapter uh, that we're going to see. First of all, then, notice... This chapter reminds us of the performance of God's word. This chapter tells us about the performance of God's word. You remember what God's word was to um, uh, Rebecca when she was pregnant with Jacob and Esau back in chapter 25. Uh, the babies, chapter 25, verse 22, the babies jostled each other within her and she said, what is, th what is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. Well, here is one of those nations that is separated from the other. A nation, Esau, became a nation. This is what this chapter is telling us. A nation separate and distinct from Israel. Now, that's not a foregone reality. We've just been told in the previous chapter that Jacob had 12 sons and they form one nation. So why can't Rebecca's sons form one nation? If 12 sons can form one nation, why can't Rebecca's two sons form one nation? Well, that's not God's purpose. And that's not what God predicted. There would be two nations who would separate and that's what happens in this chapter. And just think about God fulfilling that promise and performing what he said. Esau was preserved in his dangerous pursuit of hunting. Remember, Esau was a hunter. Now, that's a dangerous pursuit. Something could easily have happened to him. God preserved him through that dangerous pursuit. His wives were fertile. That's not a given, as we've seen already in Genesis, uh, having wives that uh, are able to give birth. That's not a given. But Esau's wives are fertile. His children are healthy. That's not a given uh, in this fallen world. His settlement in the hill country of Seir is successful. He had people he had to drive out, the Horites. God made sure that all those things came together so that his word was performed. What he said would happen has happened, did happen. So that's the first principle that we can learn from this chapter. What God says will be, will be. 
That's something relevant for us, isn't it? What God says will be, will be. God says in chapter 25, two nations will separate. Here is the beginning of the fulfillment of that uh, word, the performance of what God said. So what God says will be, will be regarding his church. The Lord Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will build my church. What God says will be, will be. The church will be built. Even in the midst of a pandemic, uh, even in the midst of persecution, as we thought in our prayer. What God says will be, will be. What God says regarding his people will be. What God says regarding his plan will be. We're surrounded, aren't we, by uncertainty. No one knows what the next week is going to bring. Uh, governments are confused. They're, they're trying this, they're trying that. There's uncertainty. We have God's sure and certain word. So amidst all this uncertainty, we have a certain word that we can trust because what God says will be, will be. And that's to be an encouragement to us as we face uncertainty, uh, as we don't know what's going to happen. Well, we do know what's going to happen because what God says will be, will be for his church, for his people, for us, for his plan. And that's an assurance for us. I think that's the first thing, the first principle then, uh, why we see this chapter included. It's the performance of God's word. God does what he says. But then the second reason, I think, is preparation for the future. Preparation for the future. We're, we're being laid a foundation here for the future because the Edomites are not going to pass into oblivion. They're going to play an important part in Israel's unfolding story. Indeed, so important that one whole book of the Bible is about the Edomites. That's some homework for you. One, later on in the Bible, one whole book is about the Edomites. So they don't pass into oblivion. They're going to play an important part in God's unfolding story for Israel. And uh, that will again be a, a fulfilment of something earlier in Genesis when Isaac blessed Esau in chapter 27. Uh, Jacob has stolen the blessing. Esau says, haven't you got a blessing left for me, Dad? Well, his father answered him, Genesis 27, 39. Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above Mount Seir. It was a, a, a mountain barren area. You will live by the sword. You will serve your brother. When you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. You will live by the sword. Well, he used the sword, I think, to conquer the Horites, first of all. But think about the interactions now as, we, as the story unfolds with Israel. The Israelites are taken into uh, uh, Egypt. They become slaves. They're released they come to the promised land, they're making their journey, and they come to the land of Edom. On their journey to the promised land, they pass the land of Edom. We're told in Numbers 20, Edom came out against them with a large and powerful army. You will live by the sword. <laughs> but they come out to the Israelites, and the Israelites say, look, you know what's happened to us. It's not as if you're ignorant of what's been happening when we've been slaves in Egypt. You know that. We just want to pass your land, we'll pay for any water. No, they come out with an army to resist them. They have to take a different route. When they settled in the land of Canaan, the Edomites are described as enemies of King Saul, 1 Samuel 14. They're conquered by David, 2 Samuel 8. He puts the yoke on them. They rebelled against King Jehoram, 2 Kings 8. They're subdued by another uh, Judahite king, uh, King Amaziah, in 2 Kings 14. So you see, 
uh, they're putting into subjection, they rebel against it, they break off the yoke, uh, another king comes and subdues them again. But when the Israelites go into exile at the end of that period, listen to what we read in uh, Psalm 137, Psalm 137 by the rivers of Babylon where we sat down and wept. Verse 7 says this, Remember, O Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. The Edomites were gleeful when the Israelites were taken into captivity. Well, then during the intertestamental period between the book of Malachi and Matthew, those 400 years, they actually took possession of southern Judea. They moved uh, from uh, below the Dead Sea, they moved uh, uh, to the uh, west, and they took possession of southern Judea. It, beca it became known as Idumea. Well, the Maccabees, uh, they again conquered the uh, Edomites in Idumea. They actually made them all to be circumcised. And the Jews appointed... Antipater as governor. Antipater was the grandfather of Herod the Great, who took the sword to Bethlehem, you remember. You will live by the sword. They took the sword to Bethlehem to kill those infants. But then it's interesting uh, regarding uh, Idumea. There's one reference in the New Testament to uh, Idumea in uh, Mark chapter 3. So these are the Edomites who now live in Idumea. Mark chapter 3, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the region across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. So Edomites came to hear Jesus. But notice then, in this history, from, from this point onwards, a long period of animosity from a brother people. In Deuteronomy, the Lord says to the Israelites, you're not to possess their land, he's your brother. So this long period of animosity from a brother people. So here's another principle I think that this chapter opens up for us. Those we expect to be on friendly terms with us will often prove our most difficult enemies. The people of Esau, the Edomites, should have been on friendly terms with the Israelites. They were brothers, they were related. In fact, they were given special dispensation in uh, Deuteronomy uh, 23, uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites, they can't become part of the Israelite assembly for ten generations, but the Edomites and the Egyptians, after three generations, they can join the Israelite community, the assembly. But there's this uh, animosity. I think we can see, can't we, at present in our situation, that evangelical, Bible-believing Christians will get a hard time from Christendom, if we can call it that, the, the wider professing Christian church. We've seen that in Steve Chalk, haven't we, in his attitude to evangelical Bible-believing Christians. They should be prosecuted for their beliefs uh, regarding uh, the LGBT uh, agenda. So we, we shouldn't be surprised when those that we expect to be on friendly terms with us actually are awkward and difficult and enemies in the work. That's what the Israelites found with the Edomites. I think that's what we, that's what we can expect. That's been true in church history. Uh, that's true uh, today. That we can expect those who we would expect to be friendly actually are friendly in the end and turn out to be inveterate enemies as uh, the Edomites did for the people of Israel. So we, uh, we're, we're to expect uh, difficult relations uh, with uh, those that we might have expected better of. 
But then there's a third uh, principle, so uh, the performance of God's word, preparation for the future, uh, as uh, the, the, uh, what will happen with the Edomites in the history of Israel as the story unfolds. But then thirdly, a, a principle of God's action, a principle of God's action. Esau, uh, we're told, settles in the hill country of Seir. Notice twice in this chapter, verse 8 and 9. So Esau, that is Edom, settled in the hill country of Seir. This is the account of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Seir. They uh, settled there, uh, and indeed in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 5, when the Israelites are passing Edom uh, on the way, God says, do not provoke them to war. For I will not give you any of their land, not even enough to put your foot on. I have given Esau the hill country of Seir as his own. God says, I've given it to them. You can't have any of it. So Esau settles in the hill country of Ir, Seir. Jacob is a nomad in Canaan and then a stranger in Egypt. What's going on? Esau has settled. Jacob, the one who has the promises, he's a nomad uh, for the rest of this story in, in Genesis, and then his descendants end up as strangers in Egypt. Esau's grandsons are chieftains. These were the chiefs among Esau's descendants. That's verse 15. Verse 19, these were the sons of Esau that is Edom, and these were their chiefs. His grandsons were chiefs. Jacob's descendants are slaves. What's going on? Jacob has been given the blessing. Esau's descendants are chiefs. Jacob's descendants are slaves in Egypt. And then notice thirdly, Edomites have a monarchy. Uh, these, verse 30, these were the kings who reigned in Edom, notice, before any Israelite king reigned. So here is an established nation with an established monarchy, even though it's not hereditary, it's an established monarchy. The Israelites have no king. Matthew Henry says this, a trial it must have been for the Israelites to hear of the pomp and power of Esau's stock while they were slaves in Egypt because there was interaction they did they did know what was going on with each of them that was that must have been a trial for the Israelites to hear of these chieftains and these kings while they were slaves in Egypt Matthew Henry goes on but God's time is the best time he goes on to say this the children of this world have their all in the hand and nothing in hope, while the children of God have their all in hope and next to nothing in hand. But all things considered, it is better to have Canaan in promise than Mount Seir in possession. It's better to have Canaan in promise than Mount Seir in possession. Commentator Langs says the fulfilment of all God's promises of great blessings to his people are always long in coming. The fulfilment of all God's promises of great blessings to his people are always long in coming. This is a principle of God's action. Esau can get his stuff done and done. He's settled, his grandsons are chiefs. Uh, there's a monarchy. The Israelites off to Egypt. Slaves. No king. There's an excellent piece on the FIEC website by uh, Andy Hunter, the FIEC Scotland and North of England director, called The Slowness of God. I recommend you go, go back and read it if you've not already read it. The Slowness of God. And he uh, records uh, in the Bible storyline, how slow things are. God can work in a moment. He says, 
God often takes a lifetime to do a lifetime's work. He could do it in a moment, but God will take a lifetime to do a lifetime's work. And he says he has three points of application in that as we think of the slowness of God. First of all, the need to be patient. He says nine months of lockdown really is a drop in the ocean in the great purposes of God. We are frustrated. We want to get things moving. But we've got to be patient. Jacob had to be patient. He could see things working out so quickly for Esau. Why can't it be like that for me? No. God works slowly. Be patient. And secondly, the need to persevere. Again, Andy Hunter says, let's keep praying, preaching, serving, and toughing it out doing it all again each week, do it all again next week, praying, preaching, serving, toughing it out. We've got to persevere because God, as we've seen, God will do what he said he will do, but he'll do it in his time. The need to persevere. And then thirdly, Andy Hunter says, the need for godliness. So you notice that Esau intermarried with the Horites, and we've seen back, back in Shechem, Jacob could have got possession of some of the land of Canaan by intermarrying with the Shechemites. No, no, you've got to be God's separate people. There's got to be that godliness, uh, that apartness. Again, Andy Hunter says, don't be deceived. Although the end, whether of COVID or of these last days, may feel a long time coming, it will come. So let's keep spiritually alert with lamps filled and trimmed. Because if we're ready to welcome the king, we'll be more than ready to resume normal ministry or whatever else may be ahead. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. That's interesting, isn't it? Don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. It will come when God decides, but our earnestness for it, our longing for it, the need for godliness. The principle of God's action, the slowness of God. And so we're not to envy the world as they seem to have everything sorted and everything done. No, no, we know that they've got everything in their hand now and no hope. But as God's people, we have uh, all their hope next to nothing in hand. I think there are some of the principles that we can learn from this chapter. I hope you don't think I've stretched things too far. The uh, performance of God's word preparation for the future and the animosity that's going to develop, the principle of God's action, that with his people and by his promises, God takes his time because his time is best. May we learn these truths and put them into practice for God's glory. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you that your word is profitable, for teaching and correction, rebuke and instruction in righteousness, that we might be fully equipped. Lord, please equip us from this chapter, as well as from all the rest of your word, to be your people today, for your glory. Amen. Well, we speed the day of the Lord with our last hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds.